This is Brian V at Why We Work, and I have the wonderful pleasure to speak with a family member, Lisa Deal Chisholm. Good evening. Well, I was going to say good morning to you, but You're it's absolutely good right. to me. Yes. I have good that, evening. That, that split in my head. I'm like, it's morning yes. for me. It's morning for me. But good evening to you and happy day Thank to you. you. Maybe I should come up with a, like a little slogan. Happy day to you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for taking your time uh, to, to grant it to me here and to talk about work. Would you be able to give us a little window into your life and how you started your path into work? Um, so I grew up just outside Halifax, Nova Scotia in a uh, um, Sorry, a sorry. This is, this is, sorry? did you... There's no shout out to Sackville, or is it just outside oh, of I'm Halifax? Sorry. Just outside of Halifax, Lower Sackville. Lower Sackville. We got to give a shout out to Lower Sackville. We can't. People always ask, like, where are you from? I ain't from Lower Halifax. Sackville. I'm from Lower Sackville. Or Sackville. You are born right. and raised. Born and raised. Born and in that's Halifax, exactly. but you know, but raised in Sackville. So, um, bedroom community. Um, growing up, my parents, you know, it was important to, to make a little bit of your own money. I would have started babysitting um, be when I was young and also did uh, a ball hockey timekeeper for a while. Oh, when I did turn 16, um, I was lucky enough to get a job with the Department of Highways for two Sorry, summers. Sorry, Lisa, why did, why did you start like babysitting? At what age were you then? Oh, probably I would have been probably to maybe 12, 13. But see, I would have been babysitting my younger cousins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It all counts. Yeah. And how did you get so, into ball hockey? What was... What so was... my dad had a good friend and he uh, organized a ball hockey league in Sackville. Mm -hmm. And so when they first started it out the first year, um, I went and did the time clock for them. Where was this? I was... Th this was at the old rink in Sackville. Okay. okay. I was absolutely terrified. Like a I summer really league know... of sorts? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Didn't really terrified. know any of the guys. Uh, actually, Sean may have been there himself. I don't even know now. Wouldn't when I that think be back. funny? Your husband, yeah. But um, that's how I got that job. Um, and then my dad also helped me get the job with the Department of Highways. I did that for two summers. So that would have but been... Everything from lane sods okay. up yeah. Cobbacud Road, which you know well. Yeah. So all the grass on Cobbacud Road, I laid. <laughs> um, picked garbage, held signs, yeah. um, dug ditches, this all is that 16, kind of stuff. You said around 16, 17? 16, yes. Great. And so then, what's, what are we in 16? Like this is grade 10, 11? Yes. Getting a little old up there. Yeah. So then I... Uh, went and got a job at Shoppers Drug Mart um, in Bedford. And I actually worked with your mother and your aunt, Sally, for some time there. And I worked there while I was in high school for two years. And then when I went to nursing school, I also worked there. Um, what year, what, I, now, what year was this that you were in Shoppers? Because I think I vaguely remember you being in shocker, Shoppers. And you, yeah, were, so, you, were, you, and you are, don't get me wrong, but you were young then. And so for me to remember this, you were just coming out of high school. Oh, yeah, you were only little. Well, I would have went to work at Shoppers Drug Mart when I was in grade 11, yeah. grade 11 and 12. And so I worked there before your mom started. Um, and Mickey and I worked there together. And then um, I'm trying to think what year. I think your mom worked there the last two years. So I was only there four years. Your mom worked mm. there the last was there the last two years of when I worked there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that, that was a great job. We had a lot of fun there. Um, but when I was in junior high, I remember my father saying to me, okay, it's time to pick your courses for, for high school. And he said, what do you want to be? And I was kind of a little dumbfounded. And I was like, oh, geez, he kind of put me on the spot. And I was thinking, uh, I'm not quite sure. And then I said, well, dad, I always thought about maybe being a nurse. And he said, okay, that's it. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> and you know said, what's funny though, Lisa, I don't remember, and this is not a knock on anyone, me, but never having that sort of conversation with anyone in middle school. Maybe they did and I just wasn't listening. But in Korea, for instance, 
they think of those things in middle school. Those they think of, I mean, you know, I guess a lot of parents have the idea of what they want, but to sit your child down and say, what courses do you want in high school that were are going to give you a step into the right direction where you want to go? I mean, that's pretty commendable by your father's thing. And for you to even pan through and to think of. Well, it's funny. I talked about it with my mother the other day and I was saying my father worked away from home when I Mm -hmm. was a child. So probably till I was 12, my dad would leave Monday morning and come back Friday night at supper time. So my mother was always the disciplinarian and my mother Mm -hmm. was always the one you went to with all the questions. So I think when my father came to me and he cared so much about what I was going to do after high school and what I, um, how I was going to pick my courses. It meant a lot to me. So I stuck with that. And when I said to my dad about the nurse and he said, well, that's where you're going to go. I didn't, um, I didn't waver. Uh, waver at all from that plan. And um, I went through high school, of course, picked my courses and I was lucky enough. I was actually accepted at Dalhousie as well as the junior nursing school, but the nursing school, um, that's where I went. And I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm, It was, mm -hmm. um, uh, I had a full-time job when I, and when I was finished, Uh, I mean, I trained at the hospital I worked at and uh it all really went well for me i was very fortunate um what was what was driving you through that like i mean you're mentioning your father and the idea when you were younger to gain a little little bit of money but so now you're in grade nine Mm -hmm. and your dad sits you down says okay this is what you're going to do if this is what you like to do so then you're Mm -hmm. pursuing that you know you still went out and did high school things and Mm -hmm and into college, but in the back of your mind, you're being pushed by this motivation or goal, I'm gonna be a nurse. This is what I'm gonna do. So you're talking grade 10, 11, 12, college, however many years that was, and you maintain that focus. Can you think of what that may have been? Like, and, and even if you forgot it sometimes, how did you get back on the proverbial horse or, what kept you going when tests were tough? There's too much homework. Oh there, yeah. You know, a, a, a friend was not it, so nice. It was, it was a very difficult to, when I went to nursing school, it was a very difficult two years. I had to work really hard. I also worked part-time while I went. My mom and dad always kind of talked about always having a job where you could support yourself completely on your own, that you didn't have to depend on anybody else. So they were very happy that I had chose that. Plus, my parents both had an extremely good worth ethic. Um, You know, my mom didn't go back to work until I was older, but my mom and dad both worked. They never called in sick at work. I mean, my father used to win, you know, the no sick days for the year or whatever. And actually, it's funny, I'm 52 years old, and I still don't tell my parents when I don't go to work, because they would say, were you really that sick that you couldn't go? (laughs) One, you don't look 52. (laughs) Two, that's commendable, right? Yeah. There's something to that that people see. So you're seeing from your parents, hey, I see my dad sick or my mom sick, but they're going to work. And hopefully, you know, we kind of have our little grumbles once in a while, but Hopefully they're not complaining about it and they go and do their job. You see it mm-hmm. and then you go do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. you know, in the back of your mind, even if I was going to, I couldn't tell my parents because I know it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And my mom and dad also was a big thing for my dad was um, thinking about the future and retirement to have a job that you would have a good pension. Um, that was a big thing with him too. Um, you know, he started, uh, at his job at 19 and, and worked there for 30 years and was able to retire early and, uh, and was able to have a good life after that. So that was, I guess, maybe seeing my mom and dad do that too, um, was kind of, you know, it wasn't like I thought when I was a kid, oh, I'm going to do everything my parents do and get married and have kids and that sort of thing. But that's kind of where life led me anyway. Um, and then to be able to do the things that I like, um, you have to make a, um, a reasonable about, r- amount of money. It so, seems like the things that you, and it's funny because a lot of people worry about the things that you just mentioned of, you know, getting married, 
or finding a job and they worry about those things. But you seem to be talking more of, I seen what my parents did and people would have excuse. Well, my parents didn't do that. Well, you can find some good role model out there that has a work ethic that is um, admirable that you can see. And then you can use that as your foundation. Mm-hmm. Where that's you weren't where okay am i gonna am i gonna get and you might have thought like okay who's the right man for me or you know how many kids but i know of people who think oh, i need to get married you know i really i this you know am i gonna get a job or but you're going you seem it's funny because i don't see it that much where we grew up of that foundation being laid and it seems because i didn't know this about you or i didn't know this about your dad or your mom that it seemed like they set a really good foundation for you. That's what their attempt was. Yes, yes, I have to say yes, they did, they did. And it wasn't always, you know, my parents weren't. And I have to say, as a kid, uh, because I have a brother, so Mm -hmm. there's just the two of us, I never felt that I couldn't do anything because I was a girl. My parents never did that. And um, I, um, yeah, they just encouraged us to go out and do our best. Um, actually I have a learning disability that I, I, I wasn't tested till I was 34 for it. it. I have dyslexia, but I went through school and I went through nursing school with that too. But my parents never, like when I was younger and maybe didn't do as well at school as other people, but I worked really hard at it. My parents never made me feel like I, I was, I couldn't do it, anything mm-hmm. I want. I mean, there no excuses basic- for you. Yeah. No, no, I could do anything I wanted. I never felt like I was, you know, you know, um, you know, worse off than any other kid or anything else. And my brother did really well in school. Um, but my mom and dad really, they treated us the same and they did the same for my brother. My brother went to um, uh, an SIT and took a electronic technician and he has a great job too. So, um, and they did the same with him. Make sure you have a job that you can support yourself completely. Um, uh, and then everything else just kind of fell the way it did. Um, I mean, I do love nursing. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, so when you entered that, what was your, or in college, what was your, did you specialize? I know very little about nursing besides. No. I very much so enjoy went- nurses. They do great jobs in what they do. But did you, was there an opportunity to specialize? What, what was your goal in taking it? And what did you hope no, there to was, become? So when I went to nursing, so I went to the hospital actually for nursing school. Um, uh, they trained us and educated us to be extremely good bedside nurses. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was my, you know, that was going to be the, the rest of my life in my work, I thought. Um, because I loved it. I loved working on the units, um, doing the different shifts, working night shifts, all that kind of different stuff I really enjoyed. And um, I hate to say it, but I like that little adrenaline (laughs) rush too. And um, so, but at our hospital, each unit has a different specialty. So then when I went to work on the units that I did, uh, I moved around a little bit when I first started only because um, uh, ho- hospital units were being closed mm-hmm. and I was low man on the totem pole. So I ended up on the unit that I worked on for, well, I think 19 years I worked on the same unit and I am still attached to them. So when I went to our, it's a, it's a nephrology and kidney and liver transplant unit um, I just loved it. There was so much to do. There was so much new research going into things. And um, you would just see, uh, like we would be involved with drug testing, new drugs for transplant and all that. So it was really exciting. Um, And I thought that I would always do shift work. And then one of my colleagues who worked as a coordinator, she was going on maternity leave. And she encouraged me to go and do her job while she was on maternity leave. So I applied for it and I was able, and I was successful and I did that for a year and then I loved it. Mm -hmm. So then I worked hard to get a job in that area and that's what I do now. 
So right now I actually work with the liver transplant group 50% and the kidney transplant group 50% and uh, work up patients for transplant. And I get the opportunity to be on call every seventh week for to be able to call people in for transplants if we have organs. And I, it's a great job. It's a wonderful job. It's and that on my days when I'm not doing that, I'm able to support patients and families trying to go through waiting for a transplant. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very, um, uh, what do we want to say? Uh, there, there's always something going on. There's always something changing. Um, you're always using your brain. It's critical thinking. Nurses have to critical think all the time. And uh, I like that. I like my mind always being used. So I'm, I'm much happier that my body doesn't have to be used as much as it used to, but yeah. my mind is constantly. Yeah. So you went from the bedside more so for the 19 years and then more the administrative side, but it has a mix within mm -hmm. it to allow you to do some of the shift work that you said you actually liked. And then mm -hmm. you get to meet with, with patients who are, who are waiting. Yes. So now I do a Monday to Friday job in an office. Never thought I would enjoy that, but I am because what I'm doing, why I'm there. Um, I could have retired uh, February of 2019. Financially, I, we weren't just there yet, um, but I will retire in about four years. Um, so at the end of it, I'll have 35 years and as a nurse, uh, which I, and I have no regrets. Um, but after that, I'm looking for a nice, easy, stressless job, like dog walking. <laughs> that, that would be. So <laughs> could you speak to being a nurse? And so you have your position, but is there the temptation to, so you're talking about new research, um, the new technology going into, is there, a, maybe this is my own curiosity, just wondering, the temptation to, you know, nudge a doctor and say, you know, I think this could be done this way, or just learning and wanting to do, I guess, professional development and wanting to venture into some of those things? Do, do, did you have that inkling to, to learn more and do more on oh, the yes. side that you were not necessarily qualified for? Um, well, yes. So um, as a nurse, well, in the medical field, there's always um, new things coming out all the time. You always have to re-educate yourself. Mm -hmm. You take advantage of every in-service that goes on. But a lot of the things that physicians used to do, nurses are doing now. Yeah. So yes, if there was a new procedure or new, or new, um, um, what, what do I want to say? If there was a new Treatment. technology Treatment. or whatever yeah. that came out that nurses could now do, I would definitely volunteer to to try and, and do. Um, and a lot of what I do in my new, in my job now, um, is making those decisions that physicians would make. Like, you know, I looking at patients charts and maybe already determining what tests I more that I need to do to clarify something, let's say, so I can run it by the physician, but maybe I've already decided what I'm going to do. So, um, yeah. Yes, we, we work with the physicians closely and they do, I have to say, have a lot of faith in us yes. and we learn a lot from them. So we're kind of their extra, you know, we're the right hand man mm -hmm. that because they can't be everywhere at all times. So we're trying to fill that gap where they can't be all the time. What would you say from your 19 years of experience and still working, doing it is the biggest difficulty for a nurse? And and I'd like to know this about your job that you're doing now um, in that wondering what it is that people can know about your job, but a nurse is, you know, you don't hear many times about the job, the administrative part that you're doing now, but mm -hmm. many people know about nurses and nurses, whether male or female now, it seems to be more males doing it as well is, and uh, you know, I, with my mom in the hospital, I have a great admiration and the experiences I have here with nurses in Korea, like, as you said, at the beginning, the bedside manner, mm -hmm. but I, I speak, I love to speak to nurses and I spoke to this year in Canada, like they do such a, they're so important 
and I think undervalued. I think I saw in an article in England that they just gave nurses a huge raise, especially with Corona mm-hmm. and all that. Like, cause you guys are the frontline workers when there's a problem, if, you know, all yes. was there. What is the, the biggest difficulty of being a nurse? And what would you like people to just to understand about a nurse's position so that people can have a better idea, appreciation for uh, what you did and what other nurses are doing on a day-to-day basis? Um, I think the toughest part sometimes, hmm, I was going to say I have a hard time with tough love with patients, but no, because I know what I'm doing for them is the best thing for them, I guess. What do you mean by tough love? What, what would be an example of something? You know, you know, you know, the patient that's, doesn't want to get out of bed Mm -hmm. and you say, I, I, you know, I feel for you. You don't want to get out of bed, but guess what? You're getting out of bed. So sometimes you wish you could be a little softer. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I think maybe that's part of my thing. I'm too soft sometimes. Um, I, I will tell you this. I found it was funny. Uh, well, it's not funny when you watch people um, uh, pass away mm-hmm. and you have to be strong for them and the family. And you don't want to break down because you don't want that family to have to worry about how you feel. Mm -hmm. So you keep your emotions in check. Um, You, you, you don't cry in front of them. Um, But then it makes it more difficult to cry afterwards. Um, I find uh, I would end up being by myself, maybe watching a commercial and the commercial was really sad. And then I would have a cry. You thought about it then. Yeah, because you just, well, you felt and you hurt so bad Mm -hmm. for the patient passing away Mm -hmm. and for the family, but you're trying to be strong for them and be the strong. And, and sometimes you just wanted to let it go even with them, I guess. So is that, is that something that's you're taught not to do to have like a stiff upper lip or is it something that you felt that was best for the patient? I think it was just something that I thought it was best. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love, it would have been nice that, um, uh, I know with palliative care and all the, uh, all what they do is so much more than what was around when I first started nursing. It would have been nice to go and take some courses on that sort of thing. Um, so that was a hard thing. And I think it is maybe to the families that people that are wondering about their nurses that, um, uh, we if we look like we sometimes are a little cold or don't care it's not that and I don't mean try because I don't feel that I was cold to anybody just always trying to be the the person that they can lean on Mm -hmm. so um you just after a while I just found it then I just found it hard to when anybody was going through a hard time I kept doing it like even outside of work, I was doing it all the time until I realized that, okay, you have to stop doing this. <laughs> you're allowed so would, to feel this and you're allowed to show it. Would you say you kind of, you become numb or turn your emotions off to it so you can continue and be professional? Yes. You become, well, you, you, um, you hide, you hide those emotions. Um, you, you're supportive, but yeah, they, I guess they don't, you never show how much it does affect you, I guess. Yeah. How much because does it affect a, a nurse or how much did it affect you? If you, you you're retired or not retired, but you finished the, the 19 years, you're like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm done with this. Was there, did you have a moment? Are you still thinking about some of those things that you, how were you able to um, process it all in the end? I mean, you're still going through it, so it's really not finished. Yeah. Well, you know, talking, um, my colleagues, we all talk a lot. There's girls that I've worked with for a long time and we're close. We actually go and spend some, uh, a week together in the summer. And actually we talk about it there. Mm-hmm. Um, um, what was I going to say too to much? that? Too? Is it too much for some nurses that you've seen? Like it's just, they can't do it. Some, and it's- 
some, but no, I'll tell you what's different. So when sometimes when I first meet a patient, you know, they may already know that they're terminal. They are. So us supporting them in the family and when they pass for a nurse, it's almost relief mm -hmm. because they're not in pain anymore. Right. Um, they're comfortable. They're not struggling. But I met the person when they were already there. Mm -hmm. When you know somebody, when they were lively and going and doing, and you know, if we had a patient that came in, had a procedure done, was, you know, everything was good, but then you meet them again and they're in that bad spot. That's when I find it difficult because um, I don't know when you when you first meet your terminal patient, the first you, is all you want to do is make them comfortable and make everything good for them. But when you know somebody before they become terminal, like a, like I had a, a nursing colleague and uh, she did some of my training when I first started. And when she died of breast cancer, I found it very difficult, very difficult. Um, because I knew her for so long, I guess, beforehand. And she wasn't a sick patient to me she you, was you know do, you mentioned kind of that you do it outside but do you have the temptation to slip into nurse mode when it's a family member you know you know i, I yes. have, how how hard i mean you're you're i think you mentioned it but you're dealing with that now is there is there something you can do to say okay I need to, that's like, you know, any job, like a teacher. Okay. I need to stop mm -hmm. teaching my kids now and just hug them or something. Right. Yes, yes, yes. You are right, Brian. Cause my father passed just before your mom did. And I had to think, okay, Lisa, you don't have to be the nurse today. Just, just be the daughter. Yeah. And it was, it was quite eye opening actually. Cause I felt I, I saw myself in the different side of it. I was the person in the room that the nurse was looking into to see how they were doing instead of the nurse looking in the room. It wasn't but, me anymore. It was, yeah. So but that tell was, the truth. Were, were you looking at the nurse seeing how she was doing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you, you, know, you yeah. could have done that a little bit differently, but. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh yeah. But my dad they did a good job. Excellent. Excellent. Caregivers. Yes. But of course, when you're a nurse and you, <laughs> you know, people and because everybody would know I was a nurse right away. Cause I would say, Oh, my dad, you know, this doesn't work for him, but this works for him. Oh, do you want to try this and that sort of thing? So yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's interesting <laughs> because as you know, you were in to see my mom and my mom has like, one of her sisters is a nurse. So. Yes. <laughs> like, so they're like, okay, there's, there's nurse Betty. She, she's coming in. To, and like, when you know that information, it's, it's so hard to, and she did a great job. It just, yes. it's, you, you want to put yourself in that role. And, and sometimes, and not for her, but as you're saying, the temptation, or I said it for you, the temptation is always there to slip back in your role and not, yes. not, not be the person that people need you to be at that moment. And, and sometimes it's not doing anything. So yes. now, yes. so now in your position, if someone's interested in what you do, what is something that you, what do you do on a regular basis and how like people have a good idea of nursing generally, the difficulties, mm -hmm. that, but your job now more administrative dealing with transplants and what, what do you do on a regular basis? You mean at work? For yeah, regular... where, where you're working now, yes. So um, lots of meetings, of course, to discuss patients. Um, it's booking tests, um, re reviewing imaging, reviewing blood work, um, uh, helping patients with symptoms because our liver patients can be have a lot of... Uh, symptoms from their disease and trying to get them to be able to uh, manage all of those at home. So I spend a lot of time on the phone talking with patients or connecting them with people that can support them, um, putting together charts. Um, so I would be responsible for uh, getting all the workup done on patients. Um, the physicians then review it all and then we present them at our weekly rounds um, to get patients approved to be able to be on a, a so-called liver 
transplant list or a kidney transplant list. What, sorry, um, once, what, what kind of list is that nowadays? So our liver transplant time, time list, frame. it's uh, now, well, livers can wait for a year to a year and a half. We did have that number down quite um, down to about six months, but it all depends on donors, of course. What is, so I'm, I'm ignorant to all of this. What is the time frame when someone knows they need a new liver of the, the necessity of it, like before? Oh, I see what you mean. So depending on how sick the patient is, of course, would mean that they would need their liver sooner. Now, most of the people that we have come to see us, everybody, you know, can last, you know, um, probably, you know, within a year or two, they may have trouble after that. But we do have what they call fulminant liver failure patients who are people that um, become maybe because of um, drugs and the antibiotic that mm -hmm. they've taken. Um, green tea extract is actually one of them, ones that we worry about. Or um, hepatitis B, actually, if it comes in and attacks the patient right away um, severely, their livers can fail within... Um, a day or two and those people we would work up very quickly and actually list them uh, on a list across the country to get a liver okay. for them yes so when they have a bad they have about a year or so so for yeah. you to have a list that's a year wait that's kind of you know the, the yellow zone the red zone of, yes it's it's a long it's kind of a long wait for people who have liver problems Yes, and the wait is the hard part. So our kidney transplant patients wait longer. They may wait three to three and a half years, but they have, kid they have dialysis that they can do mm -hmm. to get them to their transplant. The liver patients don't have that. They're, they're living on borrowed time. We're trying to do everything we can with managing them with their diet um, and medications. Um, uh, and some treatment because we do um, transplant people with a type of cancer in their liver. Um, and there's treatments that we can do to these cancer in the liver to make them smaller so that the cancer won't grow so big that it's outside the liver and then we can't transplant them anymore. So we're trying to manage all that while they're waiting. So with how is it you can get more donors? I was going to say more livers, but how, how can you get more donors? What is the push for that, say, in Nova Scotia or even Canada? What's the general? So Nova Scotia is going to be actually the first province to have, and it should come into the legislature soon. So it's uh, um, your, um, ex uh, how do I want to say it? So you're uh, an assumed um, Donor, donor, yes, I until you say no, that. yes, so, so that's a new you're locked in into donating your liver unless you're told not to, unless you opt out, yes, now your family can still opt out, okay, so if your family comes along and says no, but at least this is that every person that uh would be a be able to be a donor, all of those people those families would be approached. So before they would only approach the families that maybe had um, that on their organ donor card, which doesn't mean anything right now in Nova Scotia. If they said, yes, they wanted to donate, they would go talk to that family. Now they'll talk to every family um, mm -hmm. that has a family member that could be a potential donor. Plus with all the talk about this in the news and all the stuff that the government's put into it, it's made for a lot of conversations over the, pro like, well, I should say Atlantic Canada because we serve Atlantic Canada. Mm -hmm. So a lot more people are educated and talking about it as families. So they already know what their loved ones want um, yeah, if that was to happen. It seems true too, because I think you're being very kind to say like conversation. I'm sure it's probably a heated debate with some people, but Could either, be, way, yes. either way, there is a conversation that people are starting to think, well, because, you know, when you're younger or something, you're not, I'm not thinking, or I'm never going to die when I'm younger. 
right? And so yes. the idea of donating, like, what do you mean? I'm not going to die. So well, why would I have to consider donating? So I think regardless of whichever side of the fence you fall on, it's, it does start a conversation. People think, well, then, you know, I can. So can you speak to the difference of being a nurse where you have more terminal patients? Not always. I mean, you probably dealt, you dealt with a lot of minor things, scrapes and bruises mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, but a terminal patient who you know is coming in and will not be leaving in their own will versus a patient who comes to you for a liver transplant and is given a whole new lease on life. What yes. is the contrast so, there for you? That is, that is wonderful because we see these patients who have been struggling for a long time. Um, they go through the transplant. It's one of the biggest surgeries you can have, a liver transplant. Um, and when they recover and go back to a regular life, and have quality and can spend time with their family. And a lot of people, a lot of them go back to work. So Mm -hmm. when they come back for their clinic appointments and come see you and they're doing so well, that's the real, um, uh, that's the real pot of gold at the end of the Mm -hmm. rainbow. Right. So it's not getting them transplanted. Yes. That's that. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's, how well they do afterwards and seeing how well they do. That's the, that's the, uh, the icing on the cake. Yeah. It's, I think in that conversation you meant or mentioned that people would think just getting the liver, just getting liver. But what's lost is what's after that. It's the whole yes. new life and opportunity. And it's not necessarily taking someone else's life to get a liver, although they do no. that in some countries. Um, it's yes. <laughs> getting what is going to be there anyway. Yes. And then giving it to someone who can use it well. Yes. And I feel bad for the patients because what they struggle with too is none of them want to wish for a liver for themselves because it breaks their heart to think about the the family that lost a loved one. But from talking to the donor coordinators who we work with, for the family, it helps them a lot to grieve afterwards. It's like their family member uh, is living on mm-hmm. um, that look at the great stuff that they're doing mm-hmm. in this horrible years. time. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um, yes, so I don't, you know, unfortunately, something catastrophic has happened, um, but somebody else can benefit from it. Um, yeah, that that's the hard part. It's hard on the some of the patients. Well, I think all of them, but a lot of them do talk about it. That you, you know, they ahead. feel that they can actually write a letter to their donor family afterwards, and a lot of them do. It's nice, right? I mean, there's mm-hmm. small things that make a difference, and you see stories on in the news like someone has some sort of organ donated and. It, it is a continue an idea of a continuation and mm-hmm. it's, it's thinking something positive about a bad situation. You mentioned that it's kind of the pot of gold, but in all of your experience in nursing and now administration, what is, what is something that you find is most joyful out of your job and out of work you do? It's helping people, helping people, being a person that can help people out feels good to be able to do that. Even the person that stops by the office because they can't find, I don't know, the washroom for God's Mm -hmm. sake. And you bring them down to the washroom or find, they they can't find the clinic they're trying to get to. So you help them find the clinic or whatever, just being helpful. It's, I don't know, it's rewarding. If someone, if someone was looking to get into nursing, you can say specifically uh, Nova Scotia, if you like, but what advice do you have for, um, as the the grade nine student who's thinking about the courses he or she wants to take because they want to get into nursing, what would you say? No, don't do it. Or what no, would you I would say I would say no. It's a very difficult job. Um, not everybody can do it, um, but if you feel the passion to go for it, go for it. Go for it. How, how, is there some, say in Eastern Canada of think, where would people look or even across Canada, like some good nursing schools or something that you know of 
off just the top of your head where someone could look for some information? Oh, well, we're we're fortunate in Nova Scotia. So Dalhousie has a nursing program and it's also affiliated in uh, Yarmouth. So okay. students in Yarmouth don't have to come all the way to Halifax. St. of X also has an excellent nursing program. Um, and uh, the other one I would mention, um, I know N University of New Brunswick, I think that's where their nursing students go now. Um, but Munn University in Newfoundland, okay. excellent nursing program. And it's, they asked, actually no, go ahead. have an affiliated. So as you know, Brian Munn also has, um, so they're in St. John's, but in Cornerbrook, they'll, mm -hmm. they have the nursing program in Cornerbrook as well. Yeah. I met lots of nurses here in Korea and I mean, you can tell it's a difficult job, but they do love helping people and it's it's something that you can just and there's stresses to it and i think there's um issues nurses have with doctors and um, other mm -hmm. people in administration probably have difficulties in just trying to do their job and the difficulties how thinking back how has work even from the ball hockey girl or the babysitter how has work helped get you through life well for one thing if I know people don't believe it, but I was extremely shy and quiet and didn't have a lot of confidence. Well, nursing gave me the confidence to do other things and go out. You know, I, as you know, um, I used to play a lot of sports when I was younger. When I got older, I wanted to get back in it. I went and joined the soccer team. I think I knew one other person on the team. Um, Sully, we went and started playing hockey. I went and joined a league. I didn't know anybody else down there. Um, I, if I want to do something now, I just get up and do my research about it and go do it. I'm not going to sit back and wait and, oh, that's not for me or, um, no, I'll just stay home. I don't need to do that. I feel like I, I think I was uh, got to be, um, yeah, it gave me confidence to go out and try to do anything I wanted to, I guess. What would you yeah. say to, to other people as well, and to continue your answer, that are, that are, they lack the confidence, whether they're, you know, a 14-year-old girl about to go in high school or, you know, a 40-year-old man or a 60-year-old person who, who needs to find some work, um, but they're lacking the confidence to do so. What, what suggestion would you have? Because if I think the foundation that you were raised on is vital to this idea yes. and it's it's not it wasn't a new invention like the foundation that no. you received right it's the work ethic that was imputed to mm -hmm. you or given to you what would you say to someone that's discouraged and they want to work because they're realizing the importance of work um but you know they they don't know about calling someone or knocking on a door or you know they're scared to try something new because that's just they don't think that's them they really need to get out and get their first job. And I think that's a big, important thing. Both my kids were really shy kids. And when they both went and got their first jobs, everybody noticed a difference in them because they were a lot more outgoing. Uh, but going to get a job, and it doesn't matter what the job is, to go get the job and do the best you can and, 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 um, and take pride in the work. Take pride in the work. Um, it doesn't matter what you do, but if you do a good job at it, 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 it makes you feel better about yourself, mm -hmm. makes you feel better about yourself and gives you the encouragement to go do other things. Lisa, if there's yes. anyone who wanted to contact you, are you on social media? Are you a social media person uh, of sorts? I'm an, I'm an old lady on Facebook. <laughs> and you know. in Instagram, what do you mean? If somebody wants you to contact yeah, me about, about nursing? nursing or oh, like yes, your I wonderful have... work ethic. I mean, I've spoken to several people now and, you know, people hint at it. Like, you know, the, the foundation of which I was given allowed me to do whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. was it looking at the things I want and being nervous and scared. Well, I don't have them yet. Right. They just, they yeah. came out of growing, planting a seed, a tree grew. And oh, look at this, some good things. Mm -hmm. So I you think you just have to take that first step. 
people would like to, maybe someone might want to Instagram message you or email you or something. What is your uh, tags, as they say, you know, those kids nowadays? Tags. Well, I'm Lisa Deal Chisholm on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> that works. I mean, you kept your name. You're like, I'm going to keep my name. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I did do that. One of the girls I work with, she said, uh, she, we became friends on Facebook and she was like, deal, what's deal? Is that your middle name? I said, no, that's my maiden name. <laughs> what's the deal? deal? I said, that's so people knew who I was. And I, it's funny though. I don't use that only on Facebook. I'm just Lisa Chisholm, but, um, yeah, but now actually it's funny now that my dad's gone, I think I would want it I wouldn't have a problem yeah. going deal Chisholm, but anytime um, I say, I say Lisa deal Chisholm, it just comes out very smoothly. Yeah. Everybody does because everybody sees that on Facebook now. So they all call. Yeah. 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 So they can find I have you. no problem with that. Yeah. But yeah. So on Instagram, I don't even know what I am on Instagram, but on Facebook, anybody can contact me on Facebook and I don't have like, um, all the, uh, oh, you can't see or all yeah, that yeah, kind private of stuff. Sort of things. Have, no, yeah. Two yeah. last questions then. How do you rest from your work? How are you able uh, to differentiate um, and how are you learning to do that well? Because I don't know if it's easy for everyone, but how are you able no. to rest from your work? Uh, when I worked on the unit and I did charge for quite a few years, I used to find at the end of my shift, I would almost be vibrating because of the stress of the day. I would actually get in the car and either not listen to anything or listen to classical music. I know mm -hmm. it sounds kind of corny, but I did. Um, I, I have, I have a to classical talk. CD in my car right now. It's not mm -hmm. corny. It's good. Um, I, when I um, come home, I sometimes will just even, I just need some quiet time to myself. Maybe I'm going to go read for a little bit and maybe I'm going to watch something or read something very light yep. uh, just to let things go. Um, I'm known as um, the best napper there is and I do love to sleep. <laughs> so That's I make sure good. I get good night's sleep very important to me but even listening to some music or something when I come home and just relaxing and doing things that I enjoy uh, I mean one of the best best and and uh, I love doing it is playing sports or mm -hmm. exercising yeah. getting outside going for a walk or whatever but I do find I have to do that sort of stuff um, and sometimes when I come home I don't talk about work at all now, my, now Sean would say differently because sometimes I come home and say stuff to him. But, you know, sometimes when I've had a really bad day, I come home and I don't say anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> it is tough. That's what I, and I think this is a sort of a new question that I thought that is good to figure how people rest because the temptation is to bring it home, to bring all that home, to load it off on a, a spouse or a friend or what have you. And then you're never really taking off work no matter how much you love your job yeah exactly now my girlfriend and I travel together and we do decompress a little bit on the drive home mm -hmm. so when we get home it's kind of all out but sometimes I find uh, we both try to focus on other things on the drive home so it helps both of us that we're getting out of that work mode you both Before know that it's, it's good to talk about it but let's try to curb our our thoughts to yeah to end it well, Lisa, my final question, why do you work? Why do I work? Well, I think it's important to give back to society. Um, uh, I think it's important to keep your mind active, um, uh, to show your children. Um, and of course, you don't have to leave your home to work at either anyway. Mm -hmm. There's lots of people who, who um, run their household and raise their children and that's work. Um, and of course, the last thing for me would be to support myself and my family. Um, but um, I think we get a lot more out of work than we realize um, for those people that really enjoy their jobs. And I hope, I hope most people are in that position. Perfect. Lisa Deal Chisholm, I appreciate you very much for taking this time to being on here. No problem. 
And it's been a great chat. And I hope to see you soon. Maybe we'll come visit sometime. That sounds great. Thank I'd you. love to come visit you. Anytime. Anybody want to come yes. to South Korea? Anytime. Anytime. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Brian. This has been Give great. Give the kids kiss and a hug from me and tell okay. your wife I said hello. I will. I'll do that right now. Okay. Thank you kindly. Okay. Bye. See ya. Bye.